Well, this problem wouldn't come up with a normal rider. I mean, otherwise it would be just right, uh, oh well, fragment, throw it away, it's a fragment. But because Nietzsche writes in fragments, aphorisms, in various styles, you've got to pause for a moment before throwing away, I have forgotten my umbrella. Now, how would one go about solving this puzzle about whether to interpret the slip, I have forgotten my umbrella, as part of Nietzsche's text or not, part of his complete works? How would one bring his works to completion in that way? Well, a famous uh, argument here is in Spurs, Nietzsche's style, a book by Derrida, uh, where, uh, believe it or not, he writes a small book on this one fragment. Now, the interesting thing about Derrida's joke is this. By writing a whole book on this fragment, he has surreptitiously, sneakily, included within the text and the overlapping history of interpretations of Nietzsche this otherwise undecidable fragment, which has now become a fragment of his text which is now part of the history, you see, of the interpreting of the text of Nietzsche. So there's a little joke behind the joke. It's a very clever book in many ways, but I want to get around to what I take to be its point. Uh, and it also should support what I made last time as a, as in too contentious a way, namely that there are interpretations. It's not that there are no facts, but that interpretations set the range within which facts can be appealed to, as well as truths and canons. In fact, you may have to interpret the whole history of your civilization before you should decide what should be a canonical text. In any case, uh, uh, the issue that Derrida wants to raise there, and I will raise briefly before I get on to, the, to Nietzsche in the genealogy, Derrida wants to raise in, 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 Nietzsche's, uh, in, Nietzsche's, in the spirit of Nietzsche the question of the undecidability of interpretation. The central point that he makes is this. What is style in writing? We, we talk about a writer's style. Well, it's a writer, something like this, a writer finding her or his own voice, unique way of, as it were, writing. It's already odd because they must be selecting a voice from among that finite ensemble of possible narrative voices in a culture. Even when, as a brilliant writer might, such as Nietzsche or James Joyce, they extend the bounds of those possibilities. Not narrow them back to Shakespeare, extend the bounds of possibility. So Nietzsche was one of those writers that did extend the bounds of possible writing. Style is a creation, as you see, of this kind of singularity. And Nietzsche's styles, which should be in the plural, actually, because there are many. Nietzsche's styles open the problem of interpretation in a radical way. Because, as Derrida argues, if there is style, there must be more than one. If there's interpretation, there must be more than one. This point is systematic and theoretical. Style is only style to the extent that we can distinguish and differentiate it from another style. Interpretations are interpretations only to the extent that we can distinguish and differentiate them from other interpretations. So the very idea that there might be only one way to write the truth, only one interpretation, one last and final canon, one last book is a nonsensical idea. Good books don't lead to the end of writing. They produce volumes of writing. Plato's writings didn't end writing. For God's sake, they write about Plato every year. They write 25 more dissertations. Good books create more writing, more conflict, more canon confusion, not less. So that's a point I want to make to reinforce the very important idea that what we're dealing with here are interpretations. And that it is in the conflict, not the confluence of interpretations, that we can see, as it were, the life of a culture and of a people, whether they are what Nietzsche calls decadent, in other words, on their way out. 
a nice way to gloss what he means by decadence, on their way out. And before I give some of Nietzsche's quasi-positive mythology, uh, life-affirming, as I've been using it, means on your way in and up. Life-denying, decadent, on your way out. Okay, well, that's West Texas gloss, but it'll have to do till we get on to the more positive theoretical work. Okay, now this is a systematic argument, and I don't think that I can uh, finish it within the compass of just this lecture. I may have to return to it. But I wanna, wanted to start with that one last note to pin down that point on interpretation. The point being this, there can't be a single one or there's no interpretation, and there can't be a single style or there's no style. I mean, if a computer wrote everything, there wouldn't be a concept of style. It's all just computer ease. There's no style, it's just computer ease. There's got to be more than one to be style. There's no interpretation if there's just one. There's got to be more than one. So this is a systematic point. Okay, now we're on to, thank God some of you are going to say, we're finally on to one of Nietzsche's uh, uh, texts where he does make a systematic argument recognizable to philosophers. That means he takes a theme, he pursues it through a series of essays, he sticks with it, he stays fairly serious about it because it's a fairly serious subject. What he wants to trace is the origin of our moral values. This is not a discourse in ethics. It is a genealogy of the entire range of Western ethical discourse. So this isn't a utilitarian theory or an Aristotelian theory, communitarian theory, Kantian theory, deontological theory, none of those. It's an exercise in, as it were, going into their genealogy, their origin, in order to see what are the conditions for the possibility of all those theories and evaluations. It's a different project. It's not that they're, all those other projects are worthless or whatever. Nietzsche's after something different. And what will, what will come out of the genealogy of morals, which we're on now, we're beginning to start, what will come out of it won't be a new moral theory, but a suspicion about moral theories. Just a suspicion about them. Okay, now let me uh, tell you what uh, I think that the genealogy of morals, what is its method? And I think for a change with Nietzsche, we can actually discuss method for a moment. Because uh, we have a, now a precedent for discussing the method of Nietzsche and the genealogy. A very well-known French uh, thinker, Foucault, has raised genealogy to an extremely high methodological level in a series of brilliant studies such as Discipline and Punish, The History of Madness, and in many other studies. So let me try to identify, along with Foucault, some of the elements that are genealogical as, as a method and oppose them to a, a kind of more historical approach. One would think a historical approach is what you'd want if you were looking for origins. Well, let me try to separate the two briefly. I'll start by trying to uh, give a brief account of what a genealogy is. A genealogy attempts to uncover the formation of an entire discursive practice. So in that sense, it is not within that discursive practice so much as about it. In other words, it wants to uncover the conditions for the possibility of that discursive